Hi, I'm John Atak. This is my dear friend, Edwin Stratton. And um, we probably won't broadcast this conversation um, because we are going to be talking about the secrets of the Illuminati. And by the time we're ready to go, of course, they will have killed us to stop this from going forward. But I, I thought it was time we just had a, a rambling conversation about nothing in particular because I'm just tired of subject matter, you know what I mean? Issues. Issues. Loads of issues and subjects and bits when all we really want is a circuitous meander. Exactly. Just a, a bit of chat, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, which is what usually happens when we try to talk about a subject. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. Um, after we talked about QAnon, which was the last thing we did, somebody wrote in and they wanted to know all of your credentials and they wanted you to do other things because you're obviously so profoundly clever. And uh, th there's an expression being used in, in academia now, which is the practitioner scholar. And that means somebody like you and me, who's completely unqualified to have an opinion about anything, yeah. but somehow has, has managed to think despite not having a PhD. Yeah. And yeah, it's a sad reflection on the world, isn't it? That there are people who are not, who do not have the license, who are trying to drive the vehicle, as a professor once put it to me. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but very difficult. That's well put. Yeah. <laughs> he was at the time trying to actually get me a PhD. It was uh, Yo Sergod at Aarhus University. And uh, he proposed that the manuscript to what is now Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky uh, would be acceptable as a doctoral thesis. So I stuck back in the 50% of the references that the publisher had taken out and the the current version of the book has all of those references in. It has, uh, I counted them because somebody, see, I, Asperger's or something going on here, I don't know what it is. But to, I think it was James Beverly, Professor James Beverly, who, who'd said that um, he recommended my book um, for a PhD and that all it would need would be more references. And so I counted them. Which, which is not that difficult to do. Yeah. Um, and there were 1,117 <laughs> reference notes in the book. Yeah. So how many do you have to do? Um, but Yost, you know, actually it was proposed for PhD. It was supported by um, Dr. Louis Jolly and West, who conspiracy theorists have a real problem with. Um, it was supported by uh, Steve Kent, who was head of department. Yeah. Um, in sociology and history of religion. And Steve said in his letter that it uh, was you know, beyond what would be expected of a doctoral dissertation. Um, and it was supported by Richard DeMille, who of course wrote three of Ron Hubbard's books, starting with Science of Survival. Um, it, it wrote them from um, recorded notes that Hubbard had made yeah. while in a drunken fog. Um, so he tried yeah. to be accurate to them. But he, of course, later went on to become a professor of psychology. Um, I think at Santa Barbara, you see Santa Barbara, and uh, wrote a, a book called Put Your Mother on the Ceiling. Um, it looked awfully like Scientology's creative processing, which is, of course, um, Alistair Crowley's version of visualization. Yeah. Um, and uh, Aldous Huxley's, Laura Archera Huxley, she wrote a couple of books that were based on this visualization method of imagining things and coming into, yeah. or hypnosis, as some people call it. Um, yeah. Guided imagination. But spotting anyway, spots. I'm sorry. Spotting spots. Spotting spots in space. Yeah. Yeah. Spotting Spotty the dog in space. Yeah. Oh, the wonders of Scientology and its procedures. So the book was, was act, the manuscript was accepted as a doctoral thesis. The, the university decided that year for political reasons that if you did a viva, the oral, the last stage of a PhD, it had to be in Danish or German. And so I basically 
got a PhD, as long as I learned to speak Danish or German and could answer questions about Scientology, where they were going to find anybody who was going to ask me questions was, was another question, you know, was who was going to have been, there's no academic in the world who could have immersed themselves in this stuff because it would bore the hell out of them. You know, you, you have to have believed it to study it, I think, because yeah. otherwise you kind of die of frostbite and, and tedium along the way. Yeah. Um, but so no PhD. So I'm, I'm still um, mm -hmm. entirely unqualified. So actually, if anybody's watching this and they'd like to give me, a, if somebody from Sequoia University, for example, which, yeah. um, the thing that Scientology doesn't say about Elrond Hubbard's PhD from Sequoia University is that Sequoia University was actually, um, by the time it granted the PhD, uh, a subsidiary of Scientology. <laughs> it's a little known fact. And they then backdated a telex into 1950 so that in case anybody found out this, it would predate Scientology buying Sequoia University. But yeah. I have the documents. Um, I'm not going to share them, though, unless people send me a huge amount of money. Because I'm tired of not being paid for this. Yeah. Mm. Uh, money, money is extremely useful. Yes, now money is something, it's a basic flow, and me, I am the archetype of jewels and dough. I do a lot of talking, both slow and fast, but me make decisions? No, of course it's the past. Now the past is something, we all have some. Universal history is a bundle of fun. Now I'm getting sleepy and starting to nod, and if you want to check the picture, want to check the picture, want to check it, check it with God. To quote Robin Williamson, money is something, it's a basic flow. There's the little Scientology lines in the Incredible String Band songs. It's yeah. despicable that people of such astonishing talent should have, you know, been influenced so much. I saw Robin, oh, about seven or eight years ago. Yeah. And um, I, he's just a delightful man. I, I've three times had conversations with him over the years. First time yeah. in like 1982 or something, I spent four or five hours with him. But... He was basically, you know, saying, how on earth were we all taken in by this complete nonsense? You know? Yeah. All of those years. All of those years. Yeah. Um, brilliant man. Really, truly brilliant man. Yeah. I remember word clearing him on Dianetics 55. How fascinating. And what, <laughs> what does 55 mean? It's like Britvic 55. It's 55% orange juice. And 45% bullshit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, I always thought it was the same as Britvic 55. <laughs> but with an exclamation mark. I thought it was the year that it was released, but it was released before 1955, wasn't it? It Yeah, it's. I think it was released for 1955 because what happened was that Don Purcell, who'd bought, you know, Hubbard was in terrible trouble having blown away all of the money. Um, in fact, several people used the phrase, he spent money like water to me when I interviewed them. Yeah. And he'd drained all five of the foundations. Nobody, there were no accounts. He just walked in and taken the money. Yeah, there's yeah. a story about him in LA uh, paying for a Cadillac in cash. Yeah. <laughs> Buy a caddy for your girlfriend in cash. And so he'd run away to Cuba because um, the second wife he didn't have because he only had a first and a third wife, as he says in the shrinking world of L. Ron Hubbard, um, yeah. that the second wife had sued him. And one of the things she claimed was that he'd hit her so hard during one of his torture sessions that he'd ruptured her eustachian tube, and she was now deaf in that ear. So she was being horrible to him. And so he kidnapped their baby daughter yeah. and uh, ran away to Cuba with Richard DeMille, who we mentioned a minute ago. And... Uh, there they hung out for a few weeks. And Don Purcell, oil multimillionaire from Kansas, becomes enchanted by Dianetics, pays for Hubbard to come back and says, I'll sort it out, don't worry. And then the New Jersey Medical Association are after him for practicing medicine without a license. And Purcell says, look, I will take it all on. I will face all of the court cases, don't worry. So Hubbard sold him all the rights to Dianetics for a dollar. And that included the rights to the book, 
Dianetics, Modern Science and Mental Health, um, and the rights to the term Dianetics. And yeah. the reason Dianetics 55 comes out is Purcell, after a while, decided he just didn't want anything to do with it anymore. And so he gave it all back. And by that time, Hubbard had written, I think it was 31 letters to the mailing list stolen by James Elliott, Hubbard's uh, business manager, it says on Hubbard's um, letterhead from Phoenix, Arizona. He'd stolen the mailing list of the Wichita Foundation and Hubbard had written 31 letters to that mailing list attacking Purcell. He, he calls him a moneyed Montebank in one of the letters I remember, rather than a mountebank, he's a Montebank, whatever that is. Um, it didn't word clear that one. That you've got this, you know, situation where this guy he's been ripping down as he does just about everybody who tries to help him over the yeah. years. They get caught in the gears of, of Elrond Hubbard. That Purcell just goes, "Oh, have it back then." You know, I mean, I don't care. You know, do what you want with it. And there'd be much discussion of this in the the famous uh, magazine, which is all online, the Abbey. Uh, published yeah. by Alfie Hart, who wrote Scientology 8.80 and is credited. Um, there's a dedication in the beginning to Alfie Hart, even though for years afterwards, right into the 60s, he was running this wonderful magazine where former members and all of the big names are in there, the big names of 50s and early 60s, Dianetics and Scientology, uh, Art Coulter, for example, uh, contributes. Um, people are forgotten to us now, but were you know, significant then. Um, and they talk about their experience, and it's quite fascinating you know, as a piece of um, background for anybody who's got the time to waste reading a magazine that uses a squirrel as its emblem and calls itself the Abbery. You know? But that's where I get my Don Purcell stories from. You know, I've, I've told the truth now. I've let go of the secret. I'm not really an expert on Scientology just because I've read hundreds of thousands of pages about it, because they were the right pages. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's important if you study something to read the senior data. <laughs> the senior data. Yeah. You don't want the false data. And you need to uh, order the importance. Data. Yeah. And therefore, you need to understand and evaluate data. So one of the things that, you know, when I wrote Blue Sky, and it was published back in 1990, the original book, I decided there needed to be a chapter that explained what Scientology is, what its cosmology is. And it made me think about the data series, about, you know, altered importance and these, these concepts in the data series. Yeah. what were the important points of Scientology? Where is the book that says this is the stuff you've got to know? And it's not yeah. problems of work or fundamentals. It doesn't exist anywhere. Uh -huh. um, and perhaps the, you know, perhaps the strangest thing was, and you may remember some other references as you had the grand folly of reading everything. But the only place that I know of where Hubbard explains that we're not part of a single mass of theta, um, param atman, as the Hindu philosophers would put it, yeah. is um, creation of human ability, root two, process 47, which is called separateness. And that's it. And you go, well, that, that's quite, quite an important idea, isn't it? That we're not part of, you know, we're, we are perpetually individual. And it's not in the front of a, you know, and you've got, well, we've got to have before the beginning from the factors, and then we've got to have life is basically a static from the axioms. And, you know, as far as I know, to this day, the only simple description of the cosmology of Scientology is in Peace of Blue Sky. There isn't one published by Scientology uh, among the millions of, you know, um, output. Uh, I mean, every so often, Hubbard tries to define it as something, and it, it just doesn't meet the mark, like you know, no knowingness. knowingness. It means knowingness in the fullest sense of the word, mm. which isn't actually a word. Mm. Yeah, um, we we. It always made made me think of Loch Ness, 
all of this, you know, adding the word ness to words to try and make yeah. nouns out of them. Lockness. Lockness. The quality of being a lock. Yeah. Being ness, having ness, lockness. It's yeah. like if you write, you know, Macintosh and Macintyre, and then you write write machine underneath them and you get people to read them out from the list. They'll read Mac Hine. And it's yeah. just one of those things that knowingness and beingness and havingness and doingness. Doing this. So the, the murder of language that the man was capable of, the um, unpoetic clumsiness of uh, Alwyn Hubbard, just yeah. incredible. Uh, he desecrated everything he touched. Curiously, Robert Hare, in talking about psychopaths, says that, that they have problems with grammar. It's one of the things he'd noticed that, that they seem to fight against, you know, expressing themselves in a, an articulate and succinct way, or succinct, if you want to pronounce it with soft Cs. That, um, and, and it is, I mean, it, it's, it's a horror, the way that man writes. Am I Matea? If you see me dead, I will then live forever, but you will see a world in flame so deadly that not one will live. Well, he is dead, and the world didn't catch fire, and he didn't lead us all into nirvana. So it's none of it true, fundamentally. Well, of course, objectively, none of it's true, but there are so many justifications that Scientologists could just pull out of thin air to justify um, Maitreya's non-godhood. You know, you can justify it loads of ways. He's gone on to target two. He's, you know, he's doing further research. He, a body was of hindrance. So all, all, all of this nonsense will be deployed and more. Mm. And it is. Um, I, know, I mean, curiously, my first encounter with Scientologists, I'd, I'd read um, book one of Science of Survival because a friend of mine, Pete, was uh, absolutely devoted to the Incredible String Band. Yeah. And they'll keep coming into this conversation now. And so he'd gone to the library and... Um, not given the proper exchange for the book, which is why, of course, I had to recruit him later. It didn't recruit him. And he got bored with it, left it lying around. And I happened to be in the house, friend's house, one day with nothing to do. So I read the first book of it and from there wandered into Scientology and I got there. And when they realised that I didn't have any money at all, I'd, I'd spent the money on you know, the train and the bus to get to Mosley and Birmingham. And I, I didn't have anything. So I didn't have the pound, the one pound that it would cost for a copy of Dianetics, and they wouldn't trust me yeah. to come in and bring it to them, uh, which I thought was an interesting position. So they gave me two free copies of Advance magazine because I'd said, you know, I'm fundamentally a Buddhist. And they'd give me two free copies about him claiming to be uh, Mitraya Meteya. Um which must have been shortly before Him of Asia was published. I think it was published in 75. Yeah. And I immediately wrote yeah. to the Pali Text Society, the society that existed since the 19th century to translate the um, Pali Canon, the, the texts of Buddhism, and said, you know, it says he's a red-headed man. The prophecy says, according to them, he's, he's a guy with red hair who will be born in the West two and a half thousand years after the Buddha, yeah. and will, will lead all of humanity. No other planets, no target to, sorry, humanity on this planet, yeah. a Tigiak, to Nirvana. And um, somewhere I've got the letter, I must find it. You know, maybe we can, if we do broadcast this, we can stick it on the screen. So, you know, within days of meeting Scientology, I wrote this letter and I got a letter back saying, well, yes. This reference exists in the book of the great deceased, which I've since read, um, which is one of those things a bit like Moses writing the bits of the Bible that happen after he died. Yeah. That the great deceased is about the Buddha's death and the prophecy of Maitreya 
is not made by him because he's dead. Yeah. Um, it's made by whoever put together this thing that's tacked on to the end of the, the, the sutras. Yeah. There is nothing about this occurring in the West. There is nothing about the man being redheaded and there is nothing about it being 2,500 years. I think they did say there was an obscure Tibetan folk tale about it being 25,000 years, something like that maybe, but that was all you got. Years later, I read testimony from the Clearwater hearings in May 1982, where the Clearwater City Council, with Michael Flynn, the Boston lawyer pushing them, had these astonishing hearings, which you can see very bad video of online. But I thankfully have the transcripts, so I didn't have to work my way through the video. And there's a guy called Brown McKee, who was a physicist and for 24 years was involved, you know, some from the 50s um, with Scientology. I think, I think he may have been a mission holder at some point. And he said that, of course, as a physicist, when he read what Hubbard had to say about um, physics, he knew it was rubbish. The guy had no yeah. understanding. All about radiation is, is just an absolute nonsense book. Yeah. Um, but he thought that the things that Hubbard had said about Buddhism were really interesting. And I, I had to laugh because I knew that what he was saying about Buddhism was nonsense. There is almost nothing that's accurate about Buddhist belief. Yeah. You know, the Phoenix Lectures is he, he starts wandering on and quoting from Alastair Crowley's version of the Tao Te Ching, which he calls the Tao Te King. And yeah. Crowley was one of the few people, you know, now they use a J for Jing, and it used to be a CH for Jing. The K, it's not exclusive to Crowley, but that's the version that Hubbard was reading. But what yeah. he says about Buddhism is, you know, who cares? But I thought the stuff about physics was really interesting. <laughs> So you get this, you know, had I, you had we, you know, Brown McKee been educated in Buddhism and if I'd been educated in physics, we wouldn't, well, it's, it's like if bears were bees and bees were bears, I wouldn't have to climb up all these stairs. If bees were bears and bears were bees, I wouldn't have to climb up all these trees. It works out something like that. You know? Well, I, I always contended that, um, let's say there was a bunch of people in a Scientology course room um, and looking around me in that course room, I could see so-and-so who was a photographer, this bloke who was a teacher, a pilot. Barnstorming pilot. And an entrepreneur. Mm. And I bet my life that the pilot thinks that when Hubbard's talking about piloting, about being a barnstormer, He's talking out of his chad. But because Hubbard was a photographer and a teacher and a poet and a philosopher, because he was all these other things, that kind of outvotes your expertise. So you just assume that because everybody else in the room isn't having a visible problem with it, and of course having a problem with it gets you sent to ethics, so it pays you to keep shtum if you have a problem with it. Um, and I, after a while, I just knew because, as as a musician, I knew that his stuff about music was bullshit. It was it's woeful. His art series is terrible, and his idea about rhythm and you know his definitions of. of and and how do you how do you splurge on anything? How do you splurge on anything? Splurge. And his, splurge his stuff about stagecraft was just oh, it was some vaudeville. And I, I think vaudeville is the right word. I remember talking to one of the many Hubbard aides I, I talked with over the years who talked about when Hubbard was going to do something, he'd have a costume for it. Yeah. So he had a sailor costume and he yeah, had a, oh. an artist beret. And, and he'd dress up. And that made me think about that thing where he talks about all you have to do is assume the beingness of something. And yeah. he's sort of saying, you know, if you're on a railway station, you want something to happen, you assume the beingness of the station master. And yeah. I must admit that when I read that, it's in the data series, isn't it? But when I read that, and I was doing the data series course when I read it, I sort of thought, so you pretend to be a philosopher and you are one. <laughs> You know, you, you assume the beingness of a 
a man who knows everything. And then, and it was like, what he's actually defined here is a confidence trickster. Yeah. And, oh, that's what he was. You know, he was not. I, I remember talking to a jazz musician, a co very competent musician, who was laughing about the first Ron Hubbard music piece, which is called Power of Source, the album. And he said, yeah, we call it Puss. <laughs> <laughs> And certainly, uh, you know, the wasting two years of Chick Corea's life um, with the road to freedom. Get on the road to freedom. <laughs> just, mm -hmm. oh, no. Thank you for listening. <laughs> and uh, the thing about the uh, priests who sell you the idea of body thetans. Yeah, that's a great song. The, and yeah. it's that's absolutely the underlying thing is not body thetans or demons, as he calls them. And, before rhyming it with the word begons. Um, he tells us it's the evil purpose that underlies everything. And you go, you are admitting the truth there, Ron. Yeah. It is counter intention, other intention, and your evil purposes that got us into this pickle. Yeah. But how do you get to that? That uh, you know, I remember first meeting Jerry Armstrong and when he was over in England in July 84. And I remember him, he sat down and he'd been um, ambushed. I'd said I was meeting with him and, and a friend had said, oh, can I come along? And he would brought two other former Sea Org members along. And you yeah. could see they intended violence towards Jerry. You know, they were yeah. furious with Jerry. They were convinced that he was working for the FBI and they had to be calmed down. And Jerry just sat there in this kind of impish way that he used to have. And he said, Show me a clear. Show me anyone that fulfills the definition of a clear in Dianetics and Modern Science and Mental Health. I've never met one. Yeah. And they calmed down and started fretting a little bit that he might actually have been using his own reasoning rather than funding from the CIA to, uh, to come to these conclusions. And yeah. it does seem the simplest of things. Show me. Show me somebody who's an OT. Yeah, somebody well, who has superpowers. And once you once you acknowledge that that there are no OTs, that there are no clears and no OTs, every so often Hubbard wheels somebody out and says this person is clear, and then they proceed to forget what colour his tie is or yep. whatever. You so know, the and this happens with everybody who he says oh, this is homo novice, this person. Yes, and yeah, again, and again, I mean, as you know, I, I, I talked with John McMaster, the world's first real clear, yeah, um, quite extensively. I have six hours of recorded interview with him, and um, it was sad, it was just sad. This yeah. broken man, um, who was a severely alcoholic. Um, over the months that I knew him, I never saw him take food. Yeah. He, he drank the cheapest white wine and he drank the cheapest vodka. And he was living in the glory days, those five years when he was the world's first real clear. And so many former members, because he'd been thrown overboard and left in the water with a broken collarbone for two hours, which decided him that he probably didn't want any more to do with Hubbard. Um, but so many people that I talked to who'd been involved while John was touring the world and doing this as the uh, Scientology's representative to the United Nations, um, among other things, um, people would say that he was just the most remarkable human being they'd ever met, that, that he emanated love. And the man I met was a broken narcissist. Yeah. You no, know, there was no element of concern or care for anyone. They were just little speeches. And so the second time I visited him, he said, I want to record our meeting this time. I want to record our meeting this time. Because that's how he spoke. Yeah. I'm from Durban, South Africa. And uh, had a lovely stage voice. And he pressed the play button instead of the record button. And what I heard was exactly how he'd started 
his disquisition to me in my first recording. He'd been practicing and, and recording it. And um, Ralph Hilton, who was on friendly terms with me then and hasn't been for a very long time since, and um, yeah. still, as far as I know, thoroughly and utterly believes in body thetans and all of that stuff. But Ralph went to interview him, and I've got a copy of his interview, and it's the same as my interview. So when I said, so, John, tell me how you got into Scientology. I was born in Durban. <laughs> and he got you know, the whole life history. And he gets to this point where he's going, I came with love for you and you and you. And you go, this is the performance he gave. Yeah. And like so many performers, like Hubbard, on stage, they're one thing. Backstage, they're very different indeed. And, yeah. um, you know. I mean, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again, that because I realized he was gay, uh, there was a group in Los Angeles who, you know, an independent group who'd come along in 84, thereabouts, calling themselves the Gay Theater Association, uh, GTA. And um, so I wrote to him and I said, you know, John, these, it's fine, you know, these you might like these people. And I got this indignant seven page handwritten letter telling me that he's not gay. Yeah. How dare I call him gay? Yeah. If, if there was something wrong with that. And I said this to Otto Rose, you know, who was again one of the people who was touted as having achieved super abilities, the first OT8, in fact. Yeah. And many people know that. He did OT8 in, I think, 1972, 71, 72. Um, much good as it did him but I told him about this conversation with John and he called over his assistant and said I called you to the phone didn't I when John was last talking to me on the phone John McMaster and what did he say and I'm not sure that I'm allowed to repeat on the air what he said but it had to do with having oral sex with Otto <laughs> let's put it that way and um, his big juicy and it was just you know why keep pretending then um, in 1986, I, I was in the September, I, I was staying in Sunland uh, in the LA Valley. And uh, the, my hostess, a few months before, had had John McMaster in the house. And she had two teenage girls. And she'd come home one afternoon, shortly before they arrived home from school, to find John McMaster running around stock naked after his stark naked boyfriend around and around the house. And, and she said, you know, I just had to tell him, you can't really do this in my house. I'm sorry, you know, nothing homophobic about it. It's just, I don't want anybody running around naked and having sex with my yeah. two teenage girls coming on. So, you know, the denial, the, the this is the world's first real clear. Yeah. And he said to me, I don't know why Hubbard chose me. He said, we, you know, we were all doing this you know, to be or not to be, see the light, feel the shock for, you know, months and months and months of this abject nonsense, which at the time was uh, the clearing course OT, the original OT1 and OT2. It's still OT2, I believe, but OT1 yeah. was changed and they pretty much dumped it. But they'd spent months doing this, maybe a year, digging ditches was the expression Hubbard used for how boring it was. And yeah. McMaster said one day Hubbard came to him and said... Um, You've done it. You're, you're the first real clear. <laughs> so I don't know why he chose me. And then years later, after I moved here, so 10 years later, I had a phone call from a Hollywood set designer who said um, he was one of the first 10 clears. And he always wondered why it was that seven of them were gay. Yeah. And it was like, you don't really need me to answer that question, do you? You know, 1965 blackmail material, just in case, you know, things went wrong. Hubbard would have something that he could say, oh, I just found out. Yeah. Just incredible. But the, and he said they called themselves the Queer Clears. Yeah. Um, so uh, if any of them are watching, uh, please get in touch. You know, anybody's left from, from that era of Scientology. Yeah. So why do people believe it, Ed? What, what is it? Because you and I both really believed it, didn't we? Until we really didn't believe it anymore. Why do people believe it, do you think? You have two minutes starting now. 
Yeah. Um, well, there's the peak experience that you go, that validates it. Yep. After and what was a particularly what, good session? What was that for you? The peak it was like peak? like injecting half a gram of speed. That's quite a lot of speed. Yeah. And and what were you doing? TRs or auditing? What what was the setting? I was in session. Yeah. And then there was one time when uh, I was listing and nulling on this lad called Matt, and he just blew out completely in this listing and nulling session. Hmm. Um, so, could you explain to the children what listing and nulling is? Listing it's a practice, right? it's Scientology process wherein you ask somebody to list the things that are the problem and they they say okay the, the things that are the problem are my stepdad my job my um, my wife's sister uh, and one of those things will read on the a-meter mm -hmm. And that's the thing that is usually their thing. So you'd say, I, I, I indicate that your item is your job. And the guy goes, oh, my God, I hate my job. Yeah, I'm really. Fantastic. No, I feel I've never really known good. that otherwise when yeah. I told you about it. Yeah. So it's a, it's a process of, of getting somebody to list a number of things and then choosing one based on what the e-meter says. Mm choosing one of these things mm. and then feeding it back to the person mm. and saying you feel shit because this yeah what you just told me and that was probably obvious it, it i mean my i've told you before but my last ever auditing session um was in december 1983 i resigned from the Church of Scientology, not knowing that there was no such entity as the Church of Scientology, and there never has been. Yeah. Um, it's actually a, a kind of cluster of body thetans in Scientology terms, hundreds of them. Um, but I resigned from it anyway, even though it was a fictitious organization, I resigned from it. And a couple of months later, I had my last auditing session, which was um, what's called a PTS rundown uh, to determine potential trouble source to, to determine really what what connections I had with anybody who was suppressing me uh, you know who was holding me back and stopping me from realizing my full potential and listing and nulling was done and I'd not even thought about what the answer might be I sat yeah. there and just immediately said Ron Hubbard yeah. and the poor yeah, auditor Morag Mor Mor Belmain turned fairly white and very highly qualified trained in flag in florida ot5 auditor class six what have you um and um she said is there anyone else and and i ju it just hit me i just went you know i could sit here all day and tell you people i've met who are unpleasant but it's ron hubbard and she said well well could you <laughs> so i i gave her a few more names and she then assessed them to list and know and the only thing that read on the list was Ron Hubbard. Yeah. So she had to say, and these are the last words spoken to me in an auditing session, I'd like to indicate that you were PTS to L. Ron Hubbard. And I hope the Morag will forgive me for emulating her uh, <laughs> Scottish accent in this way. But, and she, I'd never seen anybody turn white before. I'd heard about it. But she was white as a sheet. The blood had just drained away from her face with this thought that John Atak, who was the, you know, a central part of the independent Scientology movement at that time and chairman of the OT Committee UK, was she'd got to, by, by her whole training, said that she'd got to do this. And it, it, it was a total rebellion against her beliefs and her instincts. Mm -hmm. But she did it, brave lass. Kept um, her TRs in. Yes, kept her TRs in. And it was, a, it was a year later before the penny dropped for me that this was the most poetic conclusion 
to say that Scientology <laughs> is being PTS to L. Ron Hubbard, that you're yeah. influenced by him, you're controlled by him, your self-determinism is completely based on agreeing with everything he says. Yeah. You know, and if you're really lucky, you get to sign a, a C organization contract for 1,000 million years where you promise to uphold and forward command intention. So your own intention, your own self-determinism will be put aside for 1,000 million years. Dianetics and Modern Science and Mental Health, he says that anyone who doesn't have a, a brain damage um, can become clear and thus be completely self-determined within 1,000 hours. Now, yeah. it's going to take 1,000 million years which is definitely upping the ante somewhat. How long do you think Scientology is going to last? Do you think it will be the distance? Do you think it will be a thousand million years? <laughs> Not really. Um, Thinking about those poor SEAL members in the last sort of few months of the, yeah. of the period of contract. Yeah, oh, just about just about to finish my contract now. After and, and millions the, of bodies, the uh, entropy of the universe has come to such a point that everything dies. <laughs> it's like, oh no! <laughs> yeah, I I think it it's a really interesting question about you know which groups have have survived. If you look at uh, say theosophy. Yeah. And it's phenomenal influence. I think that Scientology is going to be like Theosophy, that the, you know, there is still a, a fragment of that incredibly powerful organization that, yeah. that is dominated the minds of many of the intellectuals uh, of the early 20th century. So, uh, I mean, in the arts, the influence of Pete Mondrian is phenomenal. Yeah. And it shouldn't be, because the man was a halfwit. Um, but what we call non-objective painting, there's a rule that says that an abstract painting must be non-objective. That's the technical term, which means it mustn't have anything in it that can be construed as a real object. And yeah. by, by putting that biblical rule upon the arts, Mondrian killed 99.9% .9 of the possibilities of abstract painting. And I say this with some vehemence as a, an abstract painter and it's a rule and you'll hear it repeated what people don't tend to know is that he was a theosophist he was a follower of a man called Schoenmarkus who believed in a one of the little rivulets of theosophy which was called neoplasticism and it's died but the venom that it injected into the world continues and was part of the reason that conceptualism came to destroy the virtually destroy the visual arts um which I don't think is a very good thing. Yeah. The, you then look at, say, a group like Anthroposophy. That comes out of Theosophy with a little bit of um, magic thrown in. I think he was involved with one of the German magical societies, the Germanen Orden, maybe, or, or the OTO. I don't remember. Yeah. Then you get the I Am movement, the Church Universal and Triumphant, uh, the Silver Shirts, the fascist movement in the US that comes out of Theosophy. Um, all of these little threads, silver. silver shirts, yeah. Oh, right, because they were different colours in all sorts of different countries. Yeah. The green, the green shirts in Ireland. Bless them. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the black shirts. And every, everybody was a different colour. Yeah, can't brown shirts. Coordinated? Why can't they have coordinated so that they were the same? Like, like Liverpool, all over the world. Like Liverpool's always red, isn't it? It is. The, so, I mean, basically, with the, the Irish fascists marched in green shirts, or, or was this some other organisation? No, I, th I think it was the Irish fascists who were the green shirts. They could have had brilliant international conferences. Brown well, shirts, thinking, fascists. Might be thinking of the Iraqis. Yeah, I, I often, the I words. It's I so, think it was the blue shirts in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a brown shirt movement in the US and you can still see that horrifying video of um, Madison Square Gardens. Yeah. 37, 38, packed with people giving the, uh, what people call the Sikh Isle salute. Um, yeah. 
and but there was another fascist movement in the US called the Silver Shirts, and they're yeah. an offshoot of Theosophy. So I I think that Scientology, yeah. uh, in the early nineties, a friend of mine presented me with a list, and I added a little bit to it, and we got to two hundred groups that we could name that were splinter groups from Scientology. Some of them like co counseling, or Earhart seminar training became fairly well known. Est is part Scientology, part secondhand car salesman, um, and a a child's interpretation of Zen Buddhism. And this notion that if you scare the living daylights out of somebody, it'll be good for them, Um, which I don't really go for. Um, But shock therapy, you know. But um, co-counseling is just directly Dianetics. Um, Ampronistics, Dianology, E-therapy, Synergetics, all of these groups, one after another. And at the moment, I think the most dangerous one I'm aware of is Avatar, yeah. um, which I think has turned really nasty, and it's on its way into educational systems. Oh, really? They followed Scientology in, in yeah. that, that route. I heard some stuff uh, coming out of Holland just a few weeks ago about Avatar there. Yeah. So, you know, I know the question is not not serious, how long will it last? But I I would like to think that David Miscavige has basically painted himself into a corner that he cannot appoint a successor, and he will not. Yeah, and And, and a dictatorship rarely survives past the death of the dictator. Yeah, and it, it takes somebody like Brigham Young to come after Joseph Smith, yeah. somebody who's organizing, but he then sets up a council of people so there can be a continuity. And because presumably David Miscavige is sterile, um, he doesn't have any children. Um, I think he could rise again. Well, after his death, then that would, that would solidify Scientology as something workable for all time. That would be good, wouldn't it? As long as he didn't yeah. ascend to heaven or marry Mary Magdalene. Oh, no, that was the other bloke, wasn't it? That was the other lad. Yeah. Um, but he, he doesn't seem to, you know, Hubbard very carefully every year appointed the next successor. So in the 60s, it was Quentin, his son by Mary Sue, who's there's a policy letter that says he will take everything. And... Um, he didn't rise from the dead, having killed himself very sadly, poor young man. Um, people yeah. I've spoken to say he was, you know, he was a delightful human being. He just didn't like the nastiness of Scientology um, and wasn't intellectually tremendously developed, let's say. Mm. Um, but so he was going to be the successor. Then there's a point where Otto Rose is going to be the successor. Then there's a point where David Mayo is going to be the successor. And then, of course, there's a point where Pat Broker is the successor and David yeah. Miscavige manages to get rid of him, um, which is really surprising because it's very strong that, that Hubbard did pass it to Pat Broker. And um, having carefully given away you know, the $648 million that he had acquired from Scientology, because he didn't have any other income sources, he wasn't actually a best-selling writer. They'd had to give money to make bestsellers it cost more to you know battlefield earth i think it was a quarter of a million dollars and they purchased the first forty thousand hardback copies yeah it gets st martin's press to take it and so i don't think it made profits anywhere near that so he leaves 648 million dollars but 500 million of it uh goes to the church spiritual technology which has got nothing to do with Scientology. It's just to keep him famous. Yeah. And that's quite half a billion dollars to, to keep him famous. Yeah. Because he mistakenly believed that because your name is still being chanted, you will still be alive. And that's not, in fact, true. No, it's not when you've died. No, you're dead. Yeah. That's the thing about death. Yeah. It's it dead kills death. you. Yes. Oh dear. Yeah. What a shame. Except, except for those who rise again, of course. Yeah, and there haven't been many of them. No, there's only been Jesus. 
But it, and everybody in a George C. Romero film. Yes, of course. And uh, Candide by Voltaire. He kills everybody off and brings them back to him again. Bless oh, Voltaire. Back to life. Yeah, he's a lovely man. Dr. Pangloss and all that. This is uh, yeah. the best in the, this, the best of all possible worlds. Um, yeah. we, we should have followed Voltaire, not Hubbard. We'd have done much better. Yeah. Um, and Voltaire did win the lottery, of course. You know, he's he and his friend worked out that there was more money in the lottery fund than all the tickets would cost. And so they bought all the tickets, and that's what made Voltaire wealthy. And then he oh, had to not? flee to Switzerland because uh, people didn't like the nasty things he was saying. Like, for example, I'm told yeah. that he's the first person to have made a public stand against torture. And I find that... First. Yeah, I find that very hard to believe, but I do. you know, I I'm not aware of anybody else who yeah. stood up and said this is a bad idea because because it was part of the normal process of execution to yeah, hang well, somebody at the beginning of the day, draw their entrails and burn them in front of them, and keep them al alive until the end of the day uh, when you'd cut them into quarters, hang, draw, and quarter, yeah. firm but fair, and that. Voltaire apparently thought this was, you know, inhumane in some way. But yeah. nowadays we've got the movies to uh, corrupt us. Back then, of course, we you could go and watch somebody being flogged or put in the stocks or, you know. Now know. it's all made up. I would imagine that there were people before Voltaire. There must be, and there hopefully must. somebody will comment on it. But, you know, I, I'm not much, yeah. it, I don't know much about that. You'd have thought somebody like Spinoza would probably have said something about it, because he's oh, yeah. a nice bloke. And you've got the, um, the Munster Commune, where but everybody... Oh, the everybody is that the Munsters that were on the TV? No, no, oh. this is the Munster that the Germans live in. That they were Anabaptists or something? They were Anabaptists and they revolted against the uh, the crown, mm. essentially. And uh, because they were sick to death of all of the excesses perpetrated by the crown. And, of course, they were Anabaptists. Mm. So they were refusing to uh, observe current orthodoxy, mm. which is heretical. Um, but I would have thought that they would have complained about the excesses of the crown, in, which in, would have been kind of a public stance. Yeah. Before them bringing about their own dictatorship. Maybe he's the first bigwig in history to do it, but um, hopefully, yeah. you know, if we broadcast this, somebody will watch it who will know what they're talking about and be able to um, explain to us that it was actually cistercia in the year 374 that's who it was in persia who actually yeah. did this but yeah i'm going to remember that now that yeah. factoid that's it the made up thing i wrote a novel once and it's about a, a cult leader and he makes up all sorts of stories you know the kind of the inuit have 317 words for snow and these kind of ideas yeah. that that are passed around and the hope was that by the end of reading the novel, the person reading it would have been going to the pub and telling people or to a bar and telling people these fascinating factoids. And at the very end of the novel, I could point out that every one of them was made up. Yeah. In fact, the Inuit don't have any words for snow. They don't know what it is. I've never seen it. And the words they do have for it come down to things like powder snow, slush, yeah. seed. Hail. So they don't have the only language that identifies different forms of ice, you know, which is a saddening thought. You know, but. It is, actually. I used to take that thought to the bank, but now I can't believe it. Yeah, you've invested in it, but invested now you have no interest in it, yeah? No, no interest at all. Yeah. Jesus saves. Resurrection of itself is a really interesting idea because it appears that um, when Alexander called the great, even though he's actually quite a small man, 
um, when his people took the Middle East and were really vicious about it. I mean, our civilization is based upon the Greek and Roman civilizations and probably explains a lot about how barbarous um, you know, our civilization is and has been. But when he took over in the, in the Middle East, um, his troops, this is according to Robert Groves and Joshua Podro writing about this, they brought the idea of resurrection to with them, uh, which is common to the mystery cults. It, it comes from, I think the earliest trace of it is the Eleusinian mysteries, which I think date back to about 1200 BC. Yeah, and, yeah. and the idea is that, that you learn through an actual process of initiation that you will not die, that your spirit will continue. And I believe yeah. that that process was you know, you'd be led into a dark place, blindfolded. You'd have the willies scared out of you in some way, you know, like the Australian bull roarers and things to things that go bump in the night. Be taken probably underground yeah. and put into a sarcophagus, which would be sealed and left there for a certain amount of time, and then taken through a process of you know being brought back to the light, so that you would have the awe experience, the awfulness. The, the fear then switched to the light and waking up. And that, I think, it carries on into the uh, Mithraean cults, the, the followers of Mithras, who's almost forgotten now, but it was one of the significant cults, using the word in the proper sense, of the Roman Empire at the time that the Nazarene group emerged um, yeah. in uh, Judea. Uh, and Israel. And this idea of resurrection, of rebirth, of being born again, sort of spreads its way around. And we find versions of it in every mythology. It's always the main crop of the culture, rice, manioc, uh, John Barleycorn in uh, yeah. English folk song. This idea of somebody who comes, corn, somebody comes along You've got a sick parent and you have to fight this god for three days and defeat them. The, the Gawain and the Green Knight echoes it too in the Arthurian tales. Um, then behead them, plant their head in the ground and a crop will grow and you feed the crop to the aging parent and their health will recover. And it's told as an origin story all around the world. And it's one of the things Joe Campbell talked about in The Hero of a Thousand Faces, which is where I know it from. Yeah. Resurrection, this idea of you know, living again. And it's linked to the three days, links it to the three days of darkness when the moon has turned its face away from the sun. Yeah. And you have the new moon, the resurrected moon. Yeah. Very odd things out there, all in all, when you start looking at it. Yeah, all of these not to. symbolic memes hmm. that we have. Hmm. Most of which we lose the meaning of. So, you know, yeah. the you know the the holly and the ivy. I was talking about this today with my my dear, dearly beloved, and um, this thought that garlands of holly are made and hung on doors. Why do people do that? Yeah. Well, do they realize that they're actually echoing pre-Christian ceremonies that, that are to do with uh, Ewell? And uh, that, that this is, you know, there's a deep symbolism bound up in this. And so many of the things we do, even, you know, a simple thing, when somebody says goodbye, do they know what it means? That it's an abbreviation of God be with ye. And when an atheist says goodbye, I mean, there's something wrong because they don't mean I'm it. I'm never saying goodbye again now. Exactly. That's it. I've changed. Finished. I'm saying goodbye to goodbye. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fare thee well is much better. Farewell. Farewell. Au revoir.
Until the next time. Until we see each other again. Hasta mañana. Hasta mañana. Hasta la vista. Hasta la vista. Yeah. I'll be back. And otherwise. Oh, no. yeah. It is strange, though. That, that leads me to something which I think is far more interesting than Scientology, which is the, the way that we live in language. Yeah. And um, I think an analogy of it is the way that you had to teach music through notation. So you want to play the piano, the violin, you have to learn this encoded system and then so it's encoded into music which i've never been able you know notated music i kind of learned how to read drum music but it just you know doesn't make any sense to me and then you decode it i have a friend who as a kid uh, learned to play the violin very well and he absolutely loathes that that um he cannot and has never been able to pick up a violin and play a tune he has to have music in front of him. He can't improvise. In fact, you, you met his, his son, William Hensel, yeah. who is a brilliant musician. Yeah. Um, one of the few truly remarkable musicians I, I've, I've known in my life. Um, and David, his dad, who is also an incredibly brilliant man, a remarkable sculptor, jeweler, draftsman, um, quite remarkable. Um, but he's the guy that complained about you know, the violin lessons. And so he just put a piano in the house and that was it. And William just learned by playing the piano. And uh, yeah. I, mean, I first heard him when he was about 14 and he was play playing kind of stride piano from the twenties or something. Yeah, yeah. We're, we were putting up some paintings in Brighton at the, the Brighton Festival and I couldn't see him. So I didn't know who was playing the, this, you know, whatever style of um, 20s, 30s piano, Willy the Lion or what have you, piano. And there he was, this 14-year-old kid, and he just got it. His ear was that good. So there was no encoding and decoding necessary. He yeah. was directly experiencing the music. And I think that that we we see the world through ideas that are encoded in language and people become very attached to this you know like an abstraction like my nation you know that people are patriotic but that means that's the willingness to kill people who offend against your nation i think that's the actual definition and yeah. you go yeah well they're patriotic except for the republicans <laughs> they get rid of them or except for the democrats or except for you know some section of the nation that they despise utterly, but they're totally patriotic, rather than, you know, seeing themselves as part of humanity and believing that, you know, I suppose in Europe, we have more of a sense of it be because we've seen the nations <laughs> shift with the centuries that, that yeah. Britain, England, England, they'll always be in England, has maintained, largely maintained its boundaries since, since the defeat of the Welsh through the March of Lords in the what, 12th century. Yeah. Um, but Scotland's always been a bit contentious. But then you look at something like um, the contemporary Czech Republic and say, you know, how many countries has that been in the last thousand years? It was Czechoslovakia until about 10 or 15 years ago, which I think came into being in 1923. And you've got, um, so you've got a Slovak Republic and a Czech Republic now and Transylvania somewhere over there and uh, the Sudetenland, which caused so many problems because all the people there spoke German and uh, yeah. that not, wasn't really liked by the Czechs in the 1930s. It didn't, it didn't really exist, the Sudetenland. It was completely made up. Yeah, just means German. German speakers in the north of, of Czechoslovakia, which was itself made up 15 years before. Yeah. Um, so somebody German... was the Nazis formulated the term Sudetenland to, to designate that area that had never been designated before. And it was a weird crescent shape. Yeah. So partly contiguous, not, not exactly a contiguous territory. Mm. Contiguous? 
So yeah, I like that. Go with contiguous. That's only the second time I've ever heard anybody use that word in conversation. So, <laughs> so uh, Pat Ryan and Joe Kelly. Pat Ryan used it talking about having three contiguous days of talking to somebody. Isn't it wonderful to hear a word emblazoned upon the entablature and the escutcheon? Yeah. Just marvellous. Um, yeah, but... Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, just scratching me a scutcheon. Um, scrotum, the wrinkled retainer. Um, <laughs> this, I, I mean, I only... You have so much, you know, much more history of, of the Nazi period than I do. So it was only a year or two back that, that I found out about the oppression of German speakers in Czechoslovakia. Yeah, yeah. And there were massacres. I mean, there was a point where 80 Germans were just killed. And the deputy... theme running through East, East, Eastern Europe. Yeah, let, let's turn on some other population and... Um, yeah. Apparently, the deputy premier of Czechoslovakia visited Britain in the 1930s and said it used to be that the German, German speakers were up here and the Czech speakers were down here. Now it's the other way around. So there was actually a policy at level of government to oppress these people. And because yeah. I grew up reading the Captain Hurricane version of history, um, there was this simple idea that that somehow Hitler was this foul beast who was, which he was, who was making these stories up. Whereas in fact, they were protecting a population that yeah. had, was now pretending it was part of this nation called Germany, which had been invented by Bismarck in the 19th century. It had never existed before, which yeah. again is this thing about nation, which, which bits are, you know, is Austria still in the Anschluss the union with with Germany, you know, should should it be given back? And what about the Hungarians? Yeah. What do you do with them, Magyars? Uh, yeah. And the boundaries just keep on moving. There are places in Central Europe that during the 20th century have belonged to at least four different countries. Yeah. Nations. So. And then when you get into double occupation, you know, some towns during World War Two between. Germany and Russia. Mm. Some towns were changing places, you know, 10, 15 times. Yeah. And of course, the only people that survived are the ones who stayed quiet about everything. Because mm. as soon as you have an opinion, you're likely to be one of, one of those who's purged each time mm. occupation shifts. From Russia to Germany to Russia to Germany from Russia. Keeps going. Double occupation. Yeah. And 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 even then, I mean when um, uh, when Russian archives became available in nineteen ninety one, uh, there were Gestapo records that they had seized. And um, it appeared that there was this huge region. And it only had two Gestapo or Gestapo officers in it. But it had thousands of reports because people were writing up the neighbor that they didn't like because their dog was barking yeah. in the middle of the night. And so yeah. even if you kept quiet, if you didn't keep your dog quiet too, uh, it's like in Iraq where um, the US military arrested anybody who was informed on. And yeah. um, of friend of mine spent four years out there during this period in the camps and said that uh, in the women's camps to make sure that another Abu Ghraib situation didn't occur and she said that the, the problem that had not been understood which was very simple was that any woman or indeed man who'd, who'd been in one of these detention camps was thereafter considered a jailbird mm. you know, they, they were convicts even yeah. though it was just that their neighbor they were a Sunni or a Shiite, and their neighbor didn't like that. And yeah. so it's like in America where they've got this thing where they can ask you if you've ever been arrested for something, which to me yeah. seems a violation of human rights. If you've been convicted of something, that's a different matter. But, you know, but, yeah. have you ever been arrested? Yeah. Officer Opie and all of that good stuff. Sorry, I won't 
I did actually. I was I was doing with Mark Laxer and we burst into song about Alice's restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> so we won't do yeah. that. We've already done that. It's been flogged to death. But they they ask you whether you've been arrested before here as a matter of routine conversation before you get in the back of the van. Yeah. You've been arrested before. Yeah. Mm, yes. Yes. Falsely. So uh, are you going to treat me differently now? Mm. Is that why you asked me? That does go through your mind. I've been arrested and it does go through your mind. Mm. Yeah. And, and here we are. But the, the, the whole way of constructing the world out of language, I'm told that Immanuel Kant put forward the view that there's the world out there and there's the world in here. And each one of us, you know, what Hubbard would call your own universe. I think universe is probably a bit of a big word for what's going on in my head. Um, I think um, village would be, you know, or Hamlet, you know, that might be the extent yeah. of it. Certainly isn't the universe. Um, but nonetheless, that, that we each of us live within our perception and interpretation of the world. And that is so often based upon concepts like love, hate, yeah. jealousy, uh, yeah. Envy that that don't really exist, other than yeah. in human language and commerce, and and people get very angry about it, so they become fervent and they hang on to beliefs, you know, like it, getting somebody to describe define liberty or freedom, you know, uh, yeah. freedom freedom for wolves is death for sheep, as Isaiah Berlin put it. Um, yeah. What do we mean when we talk about freedom? You know, is it, as Bill Hicks said, that freedom is that we can watch American gladiators on 58 TV channels. Yeah. And uh, that's, we're now free. Because the reality is that um, everywhere we are in chains, everywhere we are yeah. bound into systems. That's kind of an economic dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where, where we've... That, you know, in the past, it was that some thug comes along and bashes you into submission. If you look at um, William the Bastard, as he was called during his own time, or William the Conqueror, as he's now called, in 1066, uh, he turns up and he massacres people. You have the harrying yeah. of the north, but his first thing was to go and burn down various towns on the way through London. And... Yeah. They are a tiny population who are, it, for me, it's very much like the notion of had the Nazis won and invaded uh, Britain, that, that the, the Normans were the Nazis. That yeah. they, and of the worst kind, they, they just destroyed the Saxon yeah. system uh, and oppressed the people to the point of trying to, I believe, to ban the language at one point. And through generations, none of them speak English. I think the first was the Angevin king, King John, who comes to the throne in 1198. Um, yeah. and is much maligned and wrongly in history, but he spoke English. But so from 1066 to 1198, none of the kings speak the language of the people. And, yeah. But that's the traditional system. The thug comes along, takes over and brutalizes everybody. Then you get the rise of, of the mercantile system, which some people call capitalism. Yeah. I don't think that's the right name. Where people own you because they've lent money and they are then able to, you know, where the kings would pass on to their idiot children the kingship. And my, but that did, did happen quite a lot, that the inheritors were brutal tyrannical people a friend was trying to persuade me that democracy is a bad system last week and i was thinking about um juan habsburg um who i only learned about a year or so back who was a habsburg emperor and so the holy roman emperor and uh, governor of austria hungary spain um the low countries most of Germany, you know, one of the most powerful people, certainly the most powerful person in the Western world. Um, and he was found um, with the victim 
who he had ripped to shreds and covered in blood. And yeah, I'm not sure that this idea of succession is really a good idea. You know, that um, it, it seems to me that they're, they're awful people, basically, who yeah. are narcissistic and brutal. Most monarchs, it's hard to think of anybody it wasn't. But then it passed to plutocracy and that, you know, this idea that, that you were allowed such an incredible amount of power that somebody like Bill Gates or George Soros or even somebody like Donald Trump, who's failed in business for a lifetime, <laughs> except yeah. for the million dollars a show for The Apprentice. Um, I mean, as you pointed out to me in a conversation, what kind of businessman who's got a casino running then sets up two competing casinos in the same, you know, in Atlantic City, in the same place? That's yeah. not really the art of the deal. That's the art of the stupid. You know, one in Reno and one in Las Vegas would have probably got more money. I but, saw two McDonald's on opposite sides of the road once. That's scary. But at least it's a franchise system there. So, you know, Ronald McDonald, who actually secretly runs the organisation, is still getting the 10%, you know, from either side. He is, but, you know, competing against yourself. It's just absurd. That's not business acumen. That's just ridiculous. No. But the idea that, that you know, the Rockefeller family or the Getty family or, or any family should be allowed to have so much power and wealth. I, I'm not against what's called capitalism. And I'm certainly not for what is called communism, um, yeah. certainly in the Leninist uh, or Maoist forms of it. it it's evil. As soon as you get to a billion quid, you should be awarded the capitalism medal. You've won. Yeah, let's have the money back. Now let's start again. Hmm. See oh. how long you get. Here's 100,000 quid. See how far you get. Or you could just oh, be given yeah. a couple of million, like, you know, like Fred Trump gave to poor Donald. Yeah, um, poor Donald. I, I, was, I was speculating with the thought that maybe anybody who's worth more than 100 million, let's say pounds will be generous, uh, is a criminal. Yeah. That, that they are denying humanity. Now, unfortunately, that would mean you know, Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney and um, Tom York hasn't quite got there yet. He's only worth 45 million. A hail to the thief, indeed. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you look, I, I, I would forgive creative people who've actually contributed something to society, probably. But when you look at people who've made their money through speculation in the money markets, yeah. or, um, you know, like the Mercers, Robert Mercer and his daughter Becca, that it, it's almost by accident that they got this power, which they've now abused to take Britain out of um, the EU, which yeah. Yeah, there are points for and against that, but the way it was done. Um, yeah, it was supremely corrupt. Yes. And, uh, and the, the use of uh, coercive uh, and manipulative tactics is just astonishing. Um, yeah. I, I rewatched uh, Brexit and Uncivil War, James Graham's wonderful play with Dominic Cum. Cumberbatch's, uh, sorry, Benedict Cumberbatch's demonic Cummings. Yeah. Um, showing how the manipulation worked. We, we get non voters to vote. And you then get into Cambridge Analytica, and Robert and Becca Mercer were on the board of Cambridge Analytica. And they're, do, they're using this tactic to stop people from voting. This deliberate yeah. tactic. Uh, I mean, um, strategic communication laboratories within which Cambridge Analytica and um, so aggregate IQ, which actually ran the, the Brexit campaign. Um, they, they did a thing in um, the West Indies where um, Trinidad and Tobago, I think, where the polit politics is, is either uh, African Caribbean or Indian Caribbean. And they set up a campaign to make voting really uncool for young people. And they had this kind of marches and symbols and all of this stuff. And the thinking behind it was that when it came to it, although the Indian team, you know, the young Indian people would all join this, they'd do what their parents told them to do. Yeah. And sure enough, they got a pure Indian government. 
as a consequence of, of this manipulation of stopping people from exercising a democratic right. You know, yeah. I'm going to say it, and I know I shouldn't, that the first person to endorse strategic communications laboratories in 1994 was Nelson Mandela yeah. for the uh, tricky campaign that they ran for the African National Congress, the uh, yeah. terrorist group, uh, oh, former terrorist geez. group. Oh very dear. Cheeky kids. Yeah, very cheeky. Very cheeky. And then yeah. in, in Carter did not get power, so that's probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. What are we gonna yeah. do with all of this? But, yeah, people becoming trapped in values that are non-humanist. And yes. um, I also object to the, actually to the way that I see that groups now call themselves humanists as if that meant atheist. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's uh, Michelangelo described himself as a humanist, I believe. Yeah. It means having a care about humanity and, yeah, and humane. And whatever's before the ism comes first. Yeah. Like capital or humans. <laughs> exactly. And it, and it, to then lose the meaning and wander off, you know, and get to, to believe that the problem is religious belief rather than the problem is belief. Yeah. But, um, so, you know, abstractions like uh, the free market, the invisible hand, yeah. The other one, not this one. You can see this one. It's the one that's picking your pocket, the invisible hand of capitalism. The, the market. Hmm. Whereas the reality is that, you know, we're told again and again that if you look back 100 years, the families that had the cash then still make up 90% yeah. of the families who have the cash now. And they exert too much control on the world. We cannot be a democracy where... You know, John Kerry, when he was standing for, for, for president, had a marquee where if you wanted to have a conversation with him, which, of course, would be about some preferment that he could offer to you, you had to pay, I think it was $150,000 to go into the marquee. That's not democracy. No, it's not. That's plutocracy. Yeah. The rule of the rich. And we've got to stop it. But yeah. um, I think... I think we've probably exhausted this topic. There's probably only another 100 or 200 hours of conversation in it. And so yeah. maybe this would be a justifiable point to, to end. And um, yes. wish everyone a fantastic new year or whatever it is they're going to do with their time. Yeah. Um, Why don't they do it? Yet? Let's hope they stay safe. Yes, be safe. It, it, while we are on the record, actually, uh, quite quite by accident, it was accidental, honestly, I stumbled on this um, National Institute of Health, National Institutes of Health, sorry, it's plural, US, they, they have a site online, which is the official US National Institutes of Health, where they're saying that uh, cannabidiol, the legal ingredient of cannabis, um, is actually not only there were it was a canadian study that said we've known for a long time that it's an antiviral but it is specifically protective against covid19 what's more that it seems that in patients who have it it's a good idea to give them cannabidiol because it will stop the cytokine storm where your own body oh, really? yeah. Yeah. yeah there's also an israeli study on terpenes found in cannabis being protective against COVID-19. And I'm very interested by this because everything is focused on the Pfizer, BioNTech and the Moderna and the Oxford, um, these fabulous new messenger RNA vaccines, which is great. You know, though, of course, we hear that Bill Gates is going to microchip us all at the same yeah. time. Not so yeah. good. Um, the transdimensional lizards will be taking over at any minute. Oh. <laughs> Fear them. I fear them. I mean, they know where I am anyway because they've got a mobile phone. Yeah, of course. I have a, a postcode. Yes, exactly. And um, a name and a face. Being tested by the tax office. Yes. It's 
you know, it's like, who cares? It's not great followers about anyway. But the thought that there might actually be sort of, you know, a highly available substance that is already protecting us. Oh. And then <laughs> go on in then. Let's let's be seeing you if you're gonna be clowning around. He ran off. He ran off. Oh, what a coward. What a coward. Um, but it, it's a, an interesting thought, and, and you know, let's have a conversation about um, drug prohibition and how yeah. the um, the first step of drug prohibition was the. No, you could take it back forever if you want. Is the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1885 in the United States, yeah. which was the first time the specific population had been excluded from immigration into China. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave that one hanging and yeah, we'll yeah, talk about that in a couple of years' time or something. I don't know. Yeah. I think that exercises me. So, yeah. um, thank you for the tiny part I've allowed you to play in this conversation. Um, the small part that I've allowed you to play be because I can't stop talking. Um, and um, I, I'm John Atak and, and uh, this is my great good friend Edwin Stratton and we've known each other for uh, ooh, 24 years now, it be. 24 years. Yeah. And he's one of my besties, what can I say? So uh, thank you for listening in the words of Alvin Hubbard. <laughs> Do you want to say bye-bye, Ed? Yes, goodbye. Oh, wonderful.